But what we know about kids and what Aldrich is definitely um, excels at is active exploration and interacting with their environment and embrace what your kids are experiencing here at Aldrich right now because it's, it's, uh, it's wonderful. And we work very hard in kindergarten to keep that alive and it, it sometimes feels like we're a little more like first grade than we used to be, if you've heard that before. So really embrace that active learning that they're getting right here at Aldrich. Um, the kindergarten schedule, it is in here, excellent. Okay, so every kindergarten classroom in Rochester right now is full day. I would assume everybody knows that, but it's only been about a year or so um, that the entire district has been full day kindergarten. The school that I teach at has been all day, every day kindergarten for 19 years. So this kind of a, a schedule I have a lot of experience with, and I helped to train or inform or share my knowledge of all day, every day kindergarten with a lot of the kindergarten teachers in the district that went from half day to full day. Um, so this schedule is what we've been teaching at Riverside for a while and we've shared it with most of the schools. So this is an area where it's pretty common, I wouldn't you say across the board, pretty um, no matter what school your child attends. So we spend about 90 minutes in literacy and it's not all in one big chunk, it's spread out throughout the day. Um, 30 minutes of independent reading, I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, 30 to 40 minutes of math, again it's not in one solid chunk. It might be 15 minutes of a whole group and then a small group and then another whole group time of math. So don't let those numbers, you know, think that they're going to be sitting still for 90 minutes reading. <laughs> That's not true at all. Um, about 30 minutes, social studies, science, health, often integrated in with some of the reading um, activities. And then 30 minutes plus of daily purposeful play. I would say in some classrooms that might be a little bit higher and some it might be right at 30 minutes, I would hope it isn't any less than that because kids do do need that play time and we try to keep that alive in kindergarten and that was a message that we shared from Riverside with other classrooms you know as they went from the half day to the full day that it's critical to make time for that um, and again embrace that experience that kids are getting right now at Aldrich it's, it's a huge part of their learning it's where they kind of put the, the learning that they're getting the rest of the day they start to apply that during their play time Okay, the daily calendar, uh, this is a part of our, our math every day. We have our, our calendar routines and, and that's a big chunk of our math. So in that previous slide where it said 30 to 45 minutes, this is about a 15 minute chunk of math. All right, so let me kind of share some samples of the work that would happen during that schedule that I just showed you in the previous slide. Um, so the first thing, the Action 100 is part of our literacy block and what that looks like is we have about a 20 minute whole group reading activity where we're working on elements of text, um, enjoying big books, picture books together. And then there's some independent work with word work and listening to reading. And um, we, in our classroom, we have a, a reading activity that we do on the iPad. And then there's also the book selection time for Action 100. This is where it's different at different schools. Some schools have a take home reading program, which we do um, where, where I'm at. So I'm talk about it a little bit. Um, but not every school has it, so this will look different at each school. The kids love this. They love to read. I have a seventh grader. She doesn't love to read. Embrace the love of reading while they, they have it and hope that it continues. But um, kindergartners get to choose their own text to read, and it's at their level. We level them right away. And if you're thinking they need to be able to read when they get to kindergarten, don't panic. They don't have to but we're going to introduce them to books and help them fall in love with, um, with books that they enjoy and they get to choose their own. And what they can do right away is learn to touch each word while they're reading. And that's um, something you can help with right now is helping kids to count objects, being able to have one-to-one -one correspondence. There's some math skills in here. It's all, all goes together when, when it comes time to teach reading. And what I do on the second day of school, sometimes the first I try, it's always the second day, I will give kids a book like this. I'll read the first page to them. It sounds like this. My turn at the lake. We saw the wave. Your turn. Some will do this with the book. I know they're not ready to, to do what I've asked them to do, but some will follow along and they'll say, at the lake we saw the water. You hear what's a little different, what's the same, their fingers bouncing all over. Within a couple weeks, they're going to learn, the first thing they're going to learn is to track and touch each word. That's the first thing I'm going to, have, 
taught them with. And it's that memorization, and they learn it quickly. I have some kiddos in my class right now that came in the second on the second day. This was kind of a foreign object to them. It was turning all around. They couldn't tap each touch each word while they read, and they are now a one green reader, which is above grade level in a very short amount of time. And these this particular child that I'm thinking of came into school knowing maybe five letters. Maybe a couple of the letters were from their name. Not a lot. So I hope you're hearing that. A child can come into kindergarten not knowing all of their letters and sounds, and they can learn to read on grade level by January. What this child was very skilled at was listening, following directions, get along with others, had a willingness to learn, was excited about school. And those were the things that um, those social skills were in place for this young learner. And so, just kind of a little, I hope you're hearing there some of the things that your child may or may not need to be ready to be in kindergarten and what they do need to be ready for kindergarten. Having all the skills in place for reading, they'll come and they come quickly, but those social skills are really key. Being able to um, choose the books and sit at the table and follow those directions will really what help that child to be successful. I have a student in my class that came into school with several years of preschool. Um, I should, no, wrong story. Um, a couple a couple experiences in a social setting, knew all of his letters, all of his sounds, many, many words, struggling reader, has a hard time moving to this activity because he wants to do other things. I don't know that he's heard the word no a lot. So I mean, there's very different um, levels of readiness for kindergarten. So those are kind of some aside stories when it comes to, um, kind of get off track here, but um, being able to be ready to read. There are a lot of skills that need to be in place, and it's not always letters and sounds. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so I didn't really go into the power goal and reading log because that's very um, unique to the schools that have the take-home reading program, the reading log anyway. Every school should have a power goal, and that might sound something like um, in the, the book At the Lake, the student I was referring to, his power goal was tracking, being able to touch one-to-one, -to -one. and as soon as he could do that, his power goal changed to um, being able to pop the first sound. So that should be something you'll hear about in kindergarten when your child gets there. So um, at Gibbs, uh, my, my own children go there, so they don't have those book holders that come home. Um, but what we do have is your child would get the login for um, the bookshelf, which is the books that other sites bring home, it's on there digitally for you, so they can use it on their iPad. So that's, um, some of our sites have the paper copies that they'll bring home, and some have that app login for you. So it's just um, a little bit different, um, same programming, just the take home portion looks a little different. Okay, so journal writing. This is fresh out of kindergarten this morning. Um, one of my young budding writers, artists, she was so proud to show me, screamed across the room to tell me about her snowman princess. And I thought, I'm going to bring this one to share today. We read um, a big book about snowballs. And here's an example of um, a child who, she came into school knowing all of her letters and sounds, very strong writer at this point in January. Some kids that are still at the stage of spiraling some lines and telling me what they think they're writing and we can't read it at all. So this is a nice example. Um, if I whip back a little ways, you'll see some of her growth. Um, so let's see, this would be in October. She's a pretty, pretty strong writer. Um, and here's an example, not, not a lot of writing. She's able to tell me about what she wanted to write back in October and definitely an independent writer um, by now. So any chance you can give your kids right now, put a pen, pencil, crayon, something in their hand to write with, just hope that they do it on paper and not your walls <laughs> since you're at that stage. Um, so lots of writing, writing in the classroom. Some math lessons. Okay, I brought a couple examples of things we're doing right now, but I hope what you see from it is how hands-on they are. Um, so we're just working on shapes. Most kids can name their shapes, and now we're working on different ways to manipulate the shapes and look for them in real world. And we play this fun little game. Oops, I thought I brought it. Um, lots of game-based learning. 
Oh, I guess I didn't bring it. Well, anyway, they roll a little dice, there they are, and they have to pick the, the shape and fill the hexagons, and then what they're looking for is patterns and different ways to fill the hexagon, and how did their friend do it, and does theirs look different? And we spend a lot of time questioning, you know, how many different ways do you think there are to fill the hexagon, or just getting them to think about math and to talk about math, but a lot of game-based activities um, for, for that. And then lots of hands-on manipulatives. Um, what I like about math for kindergarten is there are a lot of manipulatives. So no matter what we're doing, it seems like they're engaged because they get to touch something. And we're also able to differentiate the learning quite easily. One child might be working on counting objects to 10. Another child might be able to count objects to 100. And they're working with the same material side by side, but yet their, their own needs are being, being met. In that way, so lots of hands-on <coughs> activities for math in the classroom. Lots of counting. We saw that example of the calendar. And that's all I have about that right at the moment. And then I did not bring the PBIS posters, but what that's I think referring to is throughout the buildings, throughout every school, there are visuals that give the kids reminders about what the expectations are for behavior so like when we travel down the hall we have hands are to our side eyes forward and so we'll have a picture of eyes for or it'll say eyes forward with a picture of you know eyes clearly looking ahead so that the kids can have that visual reminder throughout the building and so that visitors to the building also know what the expectations are so that they can see it to the place that kind of what that's referring to please add to yes so our uh, PBIS, which is Positive Behavior Interventions and Supports, is really our district-wide behavior management program that we use. And it really is about teaching the expectations to our students, modeling those expectations, practicing those expectations. For So for example, on the first day of kindergarten, Marla doesn't expect that her students will know exactly how to go into the lunchroom, how to get their tray if they're a hot luncher, where to go if they're a cold luncher. They practice that before they go down to the lunchroom. And they probably practice that more than one day, I would say. And then sometimes, maybe it's November, and we have students, maybe we're seeing uh, kind of some forgetfulness and how that uh, structure was, so then they repractice that and reteach it. And then also um, at Gibbs, they're called fish tickets. What are they called? Otters? Outstanding otters. Okay. Um, so each of our sites kind of tied to their mascot have these uh, recognition slips essentially where students will get that when they're caught following the expectations or caught going above and beyond and then some sites will do drawings or recognize them at assemblies so focusing on positive another piece as you go through um, the PBIS programming some of our students need a bit more support so we have something called a check-in check-out where they will check in uh, maybe one time a day maybe a couple of times a day with uh, typically an individual that's not their classroom teacher but someone else in the building maybe um, one of our custodians or maybe the music teacher someone that's there that is another positive influence on them that can say how's your day going um, is there anything that we need to talk about today to kind of keep them on track and also use it as an incentive? So <coughs> there's a whole lot more to the PBIS, but just wanted to give you a basic overview. Also on the district homepage, you can go under student services and see a whole bunch of resources on PBIS. It, we, it just made me think that a lot of this is the tip of the iceberg of information. I could talk a day probably about all of these things and you know, that's, You'll hear it again when you are at your child's school. There is an orientation time before school starts. If you've looked at the calendar before, you, you'll notice that um, first through 12th grade starts maybe on a Tuesday and kindergarten starts on Thursday. The two days are in there to kind of cushion and give you time to get to know the school, the teacher, give your child time to transition. So this information right now might be floating around in your mind for a while, but it will, you'll hear it again and you'll hear it specific to your school when that time comes. Um, so I try not to get too far into some of the details, but it's, it's an exciting time. Um, purposeful play. I was at a workshop with the MDE Department of Ed before the state started the full day, like the summer before, 
and she shared this idea of, of purposeful play um, in response to the question of are we having full day kindergarten to increase the rigor or you know do we need more academics or you know what is the purpose somebody asked this loaded question and she said we are we're not doing this to add academics and to add testing to kindergarten we are doing this so that we can have the time and the rigor to increase student success but also to make sure that they get time for play to kind of balance it out to not let that play in the active exploration and interaction disappear and and I, when I heard that, I just wanted to stand up and clap and cheer and do all sorts of things because for a while it felt like kindergarten was really shifting to first grade and we were losing that time for play and exploration. And it felt really good to have, what's her role with MDE? Is she like the, She's what's the, the word for it? Person. Just the head person. <laughs> She's the yes. Dr. Lewis of MDE. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, she, just to hear her say that, to know the person making decisions in supporting play in kindergarten. It was a huge moment to, to hear that. So with that, that said, um, we have purposeful play in the classroom and last year the kindergarten teachers met monthly and created posters that hang in most every kindergarten classroom. If they don't, they should. I'd love to see these in every classroom. Um, and I'll kind of pass these around so you can get a closer look at it. But what we did, the work we did was to um, have a poster for every play area in the classroom. There's dramatic play, there's a writing area, there's a block center, things you're probably familiar with if you're watching what's going on here at Aldridge. But we named some of the benefits of that play area. So in the Word Work Literacy Center, we listed career connections, author, illustrator, scientist, secretary, president or leader, postal worker, teacher, educator, parent, librarian, poet, reporter, advertising, just all the different ways that this center will connect to a future career. We listed vocabulary, words that they need to understand to work in that center. Um, we addressed standards in 21st century skills that would be addressed by working in that center, and then questions that an adult in the room could ask to extend their learning. We have a lot of um, people either volunteering or paraprofessional support in the classroom, visitors, guests, other, you know, Dr. Lewis came in the classroom and saw kids playing down the block area. She could come over here and see these questions and ask to extend the learning. So I'll kind of pass these around. There, I believe, uh, it seems like maybe after this conversation last year, we might have posted these in this area on the website, but I, I don't recall. Really fun to see all the different ways. And I just brought the block and the word work centers if you want to pass these around to see. I shared these posters with um, the school board last May when they asked for feedback on all day everyday kindergarten and I shared a few of the posters and one of the board members said you forgot to put kindergarten teacher on every one of those posters and I thought that was kind of funny. So, anyway um, so here are just some pictures of different centers and different classrooms throughout the Rochester schools um, that's my classroom can you go back to the lemonade stand? I like to talk about the lemonade stand because on page 39, maybe it's 39, in my teacher manual for math, I need to teach coins. Guess where the real fun is? In the coins at the lemonade stand. <laughs> I can spend a little bit of time introducing the coins, but some of the activities that are in the curriculum, plug your ears, Dr. Lewis, some of the activities are kind of dry, not very exciting. Put the coins in the lemonade stand. They have to sort them. They're they're um, writing in order on a little notepad, practicing their writing skills, walking around the room asking me how many glasses of lemonade I would like, and then you know they bring me the money that I buy. I mean that's the interaction of teaching kids about coins and money and lots of skills are there um, at the dramatic place. So that's the place where we can apply the skills that we are learning about on page 39 for about 12 minutes. That's where the fun is. We created this checklist. Um, just This is the, the form I have in my classroom. Um, at the end of the first month of school, by the end of the first month of school, we have assessed all incoming kindergartners on these skills, simply to see what their readiness was, so that I know what to teach them next. But I think that this is great feedback for preschools to see you know, what, what kids 
we're ready for school and how can we help. I think this is kind of a real quick academic snapshot of what we're looking to see. Kids grow fast, they learn fast, but I can yeah. tell you when, when uh, I can kind of tell in, with what they know about letters and sounds and colors and shapes, I can get a little bit of a glimpse into what their kindergarten first couple months are going to look like, what kind of supports they're going to need from me because we move fast, it is academic, um, and I, when kids have a hard time counting to three or five, they struggle with numbers for a while. We work really hard to get them caught up, but it's really nice if they can count to ten. It helps them to kind of keep with the pace of the classroom. Make sense? So let me share with you kind of what we're what we're looking at. Um, typically, five or less letters, five or less sounds. It's going to take them a little extra work to get kind of up to speed with their peers. Um, we're looking at like 13 or more letters. Ready. Those are the kiddos that usually pick up fast. Not always. I'm being kind of general here, but typically that's what I see when they know 13 or more letters, they are ready to rock and roll and they're ready for our pacing because we do, it's a pretty rigorous pace. Um, they're typically pretty ready. Um, colors, every kiddo knew all their colors coming into my classroom this year. When they aren't able to name all the colors, it makes me wonder you know, what was their exposure to books and stories? Have they been read to? Because kids kind of pick up on those things um, through conversation and books with you. So talk to your kids, read books with your kids. They're going to pick up on these skills. Uh, shapes, shapes are just tricky. It's hard to get that little mouth to say triangle and rectangle sometimes. So um, usually if they know two or th two of the shapes, if they can name them, that's great. Um, number recognition, they can recognize, um, we're looking can they recognize up to 10, 0 to 10? That's usually a pretty good indicator that they're ready. Doesn't mean they're not ready, it's just a good academic um, snapshot for us. And then we're looking to see if they can count to 10. That's what I'm assessing them on in that first month. And then that one-to-one -one correspondence. When I was sharing this book with you, if they could count, I'll put out five, fi five little fish on the table, if they can count one, two, three, four, five, I know they're ready for tracking. So that's usually kind of a hard thing for kiddos to do. So if that's something you could work on, it would be great for your child to just be able to count objects. Um, and so those are the things that we assess in that first month to see where they're at and where they need to go. And I have this for you. you can keep it. <laughs> If you want, if you want access to it, but, I'll just um, interject here. Sure. This is a sheet that we use here at Aldridge for four-year-olds before they leave us, and we share that with the kindergarten teachers, so they have that information. And you will talk with them in those early days, and the teachers will quickly pick up on it. But these are things that we're assessing that we'll share with you in that parent conference in the spring about being ready for kindergarten. This is one of the many, many pieces. The social emotional is reflected here, but that's just as important as all of these pieces as well. So. This is one of our many pieces of observation that we'll do and share with your children uh, as they head towards the Awesome, Link. Great. Uh, let's see. Things to work on now. Registration. Is that going on? Yeah, will you talk about registration? I'm not really sure what, what the dates and all of that. I was right eavesdropping now. a little bit and heard parents already talking about that they had gotten their registration packets. Um, so we encourage you to register as early as you possibly can. Registration is open now. Um, you can do that in the Edison building, which is 615 7th Street. It's um, you know, by Soldier's Field. Um, just come to the Edison building. There's paperwork that you either can get in the mail. If you didn't get it in the mail, just come to Edison. Uh, drop off all your paperwork and then that gets you registered so then some of the things that we're going to talk about in a minute we have you on our list <coughs> and ready to go now some of you will already be in our database which is why you got the mailing so anyone who was born any of your children that was born in Olmstead County we get that census data so that's how we know that 
your child exists. However, if they weren't born in the county, we wouldn't automatically have their information. So please make sure that if you haven't gotten the information, you should have gotten it already, come to records and registration. I oversee that department too. Um, so if you have any concerns about that, you can shoot an email to me or um, just call my office it's on the website. You'll see how to do that um, so that we can get you registered. And then there's some upcoming events in the spring that we want to get you invited to. So you can do it all on the website. You can do it all online. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Um, some things you can do now. Build that independence in kids right now in our little world in kindergarten. They can get their snow clothes on by themselves zipped hats, mittens, everything. They have about eight to 10 minutes more of recess than everybody else. And recess is about 20, 25 minutes. It's a lot of play time. They miss out on if they need to stand and wait for that help. We're happy to help them, but there's that wait factor, <laughs> which can be hard. Um, so, and they learn pretty quickly, well, if I can do this myself, I'm out of here. <laughs> They're out for recess. So as much as you want to help them, if when it when time allows, let them do it themselves. If it's a hurry, do it for them, but try to really help them um, become independent in dressing themselves. That's a big, big deal. And they're so proud when they can do it on their own also. Um, things to do now, read, read with your kids, talk with them, build their vocabulary. Um, there's, in the, kind of all links back to this learning how to read, uh, there are many books with, with words they I, I sometimes I'm amazed at what words kids aren't familiar with and um, just conversation with your kids build that vocabulary I had a student reading a zoo book this uh, fall looking at a zoo book and didn't know the names of some of what I would consider typical common zoo animals and you know that stuff is that information is picked up through conversation. So don't assume they know it. Talk with them about um, everything and anything. Visit your school. Visit your child's future school. Secretaries love it when I do this, especially now that we have the security buttons. But I still tell you that this is a great idea because sometimes that transition to a new school can be big and scary and any chance you can get to visit that school right now is great if there are siblings there already you're in they know the school they already own the school because they're going to school there just like my big brother and sister right but some kids if they're maybe they are the younger sibling and they're a little more anxious or maybe they are the first child going to that school collect these like you do for aldrich but save a few in a baggie don't give them all to aldrich right now take a couple to that new school they will welcome you in. You can get a feel for the school, find the place where the box tops and milk moolah caps, every school collects them, and drop them off. And if your child, if it's a child who's kind of anxious, they're gonna be ready to go as soon as they drop these off. It's fine, maybe make this stay a little bit longer the next time, maybe find a bathroom, take a bathroom break. Just visit the school frequently. Visit the playground, not during school hours, um, but visit the playground or something just help them to get familiar with that space and really you know talk up this is going to be your new school and get them excited about it so that first day when they're walking into the school and you're walking the other way they know it's going to be okay All right? and it's just as much just as important for you as it is for them I often see more parents crying on first day of kindergarten than kindergartners so get yourself ready um, and then practice no if you haven't told your child no yet, <laughs> you need to. Because <laughs> when they get into the classroom with 18, 19 other friends and they want to do something and they want to do it now, I don't want to be the first one to tell them no, not yet. No, please wait. Um, it's, it's good to practice it. Um, I didn't say no to my kids for a while, <laughs> but I learned. <laughs> I learned quickly. And then also to um, to help with that independence and accountability for, for kiddos right now, just if you say you're going to do something, do it and mean it. When they get into the kindergarten classroom and I say it's lunchtime, it's not lunchtime in 15 minutes, it's not five more minutes, five more minutes, five more minutes to lunch, five more minutes to lunch, five more minutes till we go to lunch, it's lunchtime now <laughs> and we have to be down there on a schedule or there'll be 60 more kids behind us in the lunch line and we're going to miss lunch. So it's kind of that when you say something's going to happen, it needs to happen 
kind of help them get used to that schedule because the world of kindergarten does move pretty fast in a elementary school setting. We need to be somewhere, we need to be there kind of now. Um, sometimes that transition to music class or PE class can take a really long time because someone's laying on the floor having that fit, they, don't, they weren't ready to go or something. And anything you can do to just give them practice with that transitioning from place to place and doing it in a quick, efficient way will help when they get to kindergarten. Um, upcoming events. One of the things that we started, I believe, district-wide last year was a kindergarten preview day. And that's coming up in the spring, which is why I need to register so that we can make sure we have you um, in our system and ready to get this mailing. So each site does uh, something unique to their site, but we have it at all sites. So they'll invite you in. And it's a time to bring your kindergartner, so they'll be able to see the school. It's typically in the springtime. There's some activities there. Some of our sites do a parent component. Some don't. It just really depends on each site, but you'll receive information on that. And then that helps with a little bit of the anxiety for both the parents and the kindergartner, that they get to uh, walk into that school and start to kind of familiarize themselves, which is exactly what Marla was talking about. I can share what we did at Riverside last spring. We had our current kindergartners in the classroom, and we we didn't know how many people were going to come, so we just kind of had a plan to fill five or you know six kin kids in each classroom. So we had we had about six incoming kindergarten guests in our classroom, and boy, were my current students just like ready to show <laughs> them the ropes. Uh, but we. We had them join us for a story and had a few activities at the tables and the big kindergartners showed the future kindergartners, you know, just how kindergarten worked and it was really neat to see the excitement of the incoming kids and the, some were confident, some were a little shy and to see the current kiddos share with them what, what school was all about. In fact, just today, a student that came to that last spring, I, I couldn't believe where he was at today. I mean, I remember what he was like when he came to that spring day. I mean, like a bouncy ball going through the classroom. And now he's just this great rock star of a kindergartner. And I just think, wow, and what an amazing, you know, change through for this boy through the, the months. And I asked him, do you remember the first time you met us and you came to school? And he said, yes. And it was just a really neat little connection, but really helped with that transition. So, good, a good event, watch for it. The next one is our Summer Community Education Kindergarten Readiness class. Both Ugo and Montana did this class um, through the district, my two uh, children, and we loved it. Um, there is a fee to it, but if financing that class is an issue for you, contact our Community Ed Department. That, again, the key here is register. So once you're registered, um, in the spring then you'll be on our mailing list for all of this. So this is, I think it's four or five days where they come and it's a pretty full day, like nine to three. Mm -hmm. So just a little bit shorter in the afternoon than our regular kindergarten day would be. But it's really like a little bit more play, a little bit less structure, but it's a really great introduction for those five days this summer so that they can be there and um, see the school kind of understanding kindergartner, kindergarten and what it's like to be there. I think it also helps parents transition a little bit to that drop off, that pick up, and it potentially I think makes the first day of school all that much better for you. So I would highly, highly recommend this uh, program to you. So say that again. The name of it, it um, is under our community education, and it's just the kindergarten readiness class. But you'll get a special mailer about that. Yeah. Yeah. I think last year they might have called it kickoff to kindergarten, kindergarten. maybe. Um, so yeah. it had a little you'll know exactly what it is when you get yes. it. So. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot. There were a lot of flyers that went out for yeah. it. Yeah. And maybe that's something we can get a flyer here. Yeah. Or exactly. Perfect. Then you want to talk about your um, that week right before school starts? Yeah, and I did kind of mention a little bit before school starts. There's two days that are dedicated to um, helping kindergartners and families transition and get to know their classroom and their teacher and um, what that tip. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, it looks a little different at each site. 
the goal is to have some time with parents for parent information to be shared and for students to have time in the classroom separate from parents. What we, what we do at our school is we have, um, it's about an hour and a half, and the, there's a half an hour where the parents are with our reading teachers learning about Action 100. There's half an hour where the parents are with the classroom teacher and the kids are with the paraprofessionals and then there's about 20 minutes where everybody's all together in the classroom exploring together so they can practice that separation. Okay, with that, um, we will open it up to any questions that you might have. And just so that it's recorded, we will actually repeat your question so that the microphone picks it up. Yes. Yeah. So, so you mentioned that you know we need to register, and even if you know you register with particular school, do I need to do second time registration, or that's one time is enough? Great question. So the question was. Once I'm registered, do I need to continue registering year after year? Once you're in, you're in and you're registered, so that'll just carry you through. However, if you change addresses, uh, but you're still in the uh, Rochester School District, we would just ask that you update your address with us. A question sometimes is, if I change, if I have my student already in kindergarten, and then we move, and we move out of uh, that boundary for that particular school what happens then you can either choose to go to that new school where your new house your new um, place that you're living is or you can actually file what's called an exception uh, to attendance with my department and we if you want to stay at the school that you're currently at we allow that to happen so but usually you just need to register once and be done What is the age for the summer community at kindergarten readiness class? That is right when they're entering kindergarten, so the summer before they start kindergarten. And they need to be registered in order to come to that class, Correct. right? Yeah, you need to be registered in our district. Because we try to have it so that your child attends the class at the school they'll attend. So we need to know which school. There was some I was just going to say, if you're doing activities with your kids with uh, preparedness sort of in mind, and there's something they really enjoy, and you feel like you're, you're reaching a stage where they're at or, or exceeding some of those levels you can talk about, is there a danger of ever taking your kid too fast? They end up like being bored when they get to kindergarten? Or is that I'm just going to repeat the question. Sure, and, and I, can, I can address So that, the yes. question is a very good one. So. We are working on activities with our child. Can you overdo it? Can you over prepare them for kindergarten? I don't think you can over prepare them for learning and being in, in a learning environment. I have experienced kids coming in reading at a second or third grade level. Their math is at a second grade level. But there's often something that still needs to be worked on or focused on there are often the strengths and weaknesses and um, I'm thinking of a of some students I've had through the years where um, very strong academics playing Candyland traumatic <laughs> <laughs> hard to win hard to lose so we focused on a lot of social skills we usually find not like you know, a nitpick and look for some but there's usually an area where we see let's work on this let's develop this area and, and there are also resources in the district to help with um, an accelerated learner. We have some gifted and talented classes, and we'll channel their academics where we need to to make sure that they continue to grow. So don't stop the teaching. Mm -hmm. um, my son's going to be going to the Spanish Immersion School. Is he going to need to know? He knows his colors in English great. You know, does he know need to know the Spanish alphabet as well as the English alphabet? Um, what does he need to know for that, I guess? <laughs> so my uh, student is going to the Spanish Immersion, which is located at Gage. What do they need to know in Spanish to enter kindergarten? Nothing. So, yep, yep, um, and we do have a variety of learners there, which is one of the beauties of that program. So we might have students there that are 
fluent in Spanish. We might have students there that have never heard or spoken one word of Spanish. So however they come um, is just fine with us. So you don't need to be practicing those colors in Spanish or doing any of that. And, and the same readiness to would be to know the other English. readiness Absolutely. that you gave us. <laughs> Great. Is the district-wide option closed now? Is that all filled out? Or? Sure. Great question. So is the district-wide option closed? So the way that the district-wide options work, so in our district there are some sites that are what are called district-wide option schools. So that's Lincoln, Longfellow, Washington, Montessori at Franklin, Gage um, Spanish Immersion, thank you. Um, and then at the middle school we have Fridell. So we have already done the first selection process, so that means anyone that submitted their application for kindergarten for this year, we've done that selection process, and then some families have been put in a waiting pool. But at this time, it's very fluid because people are, like for example myself, um, I had enrolled Hugo in the Kindergarten Gage Spanish Immersion Program, and then I decided in about April, you know what? He's an August 20th birthday, and guess what I did? Didn't send him that year, so I withdrew my spot. So that happens all the time, where families will have a spot, and then as it gets closer, they maybe decide they want to go to their neighborhood school, or um, <coughs> life circumstances change. So for right now, we will not be doing any more selections until spots open up. However, spots open up rapidly in kindergarten at this time of the year because families are still making their choices. If you have not applied but are interested in that, go ahead and apply and you will be uh, put in that waiting pool so then the next time there's a selection process, you'll be included at that. The selection processes also occur. You may not get in right away for kindergarten, but someone might move out in November. Their family might relocate, so then we'll do a selection process and call and some families say yep I'm ready let's go and then we'll work with you on the transition sometimes they want to come after winter break whatever and sometimes families say nope keep us on the list for next year but we aren't ready to transition over and some families say we're very very happy we don't want to have our child switch schools at this point then for the upper grade levels um, first second third fourth fifth as spots become available then we make the selection because right now our learners that are going from kindergarten to first grade, we don't have additional spots open unless families withdraw from those sites. So, um, so yes, in a way, we have our first selection process done, but don't be discouraged and go ahead and put your application in for that. I believe that I still have maybe one or two spots engaged Spanish immersion. The other uh, district-wide options, you would be um, in the waiting pool at this time. So how does instruction look in a kindergarten classroom when we have all different levels, some students coming in knowing 10 letters and um, some letter sounds and some students coming in that are uh, pretty fluent readers? How do you uh, work with that? Okay. So our core instruction meets is new instruction for all students and in regards to reading it would be focused on comprehension which is still a skill a second grade reader would need but it would be in a text that was appropriate for that reader. So they would still be working on comprehension but at their reading level. Okay, um, So that's our core reading instruction. So if I'm focusing on setting or character and there's a child reading um, a book with five pages in a very simple text, they're able to talk with me about comprehension. I would be working with the second grade level reader in kindergarten on setting and character but at a text at their level. Make, make sense? And then we, when we get into a small group instruction, I'm able to differentiate and have different activities for different leveled readers. And they would rotate through those activities. 
and then I have time where I conference with each student at their reading level. So I'm asking them questions and, and looking for skills at their level. But I'm conferencing with every student, but I'm working at their <laughs> reading level. So, for example, when I'm working with um, a 2Y beginning reader, I'm going to ask them to, um, you know, point to each word as they read. If I have a red reader, I'm going to look for active, and those would be under the active reading habits. While they're reading, are they touching each word? For a 1R reader, which is more like a second grade, the active reading habits would be to figure out three syllable words from chunking. So we're working on reading habits, but I, I know what level they're at. Questions. Go ahead. Was he born in the county? Okay, register now. Um, and I will call it a little bit different than registering. So you would, um, I'll give you my example. My two oldest. Uh, children were not born here when I came to the district. They weren't um, <coughs> eligible for kindergarten. Obviously, they were younger. I got them in. Why did I get them in? So that we could send you information <coughs> to say get your child screened. So, um, have you registered at all? Okay, so go ahead and do that and then um, sign up for that early childhood screening through community education as well. Yep. Yep. So, great question. Good one. Yes. Um, just kind of a question on reading, even if it's not in Spanish, but um, sounding out versus sight words at the kindergarten, you know, kick off the kindergarten thing. Somebody there told me, don't try and teach them to sound out words to learn to read because we may have to go and undo that because we do sight words. So if I do want to kind of work with him and get him started reading, what method is best? So as a parent, uh, when I'm at home reading and my child is showing that interest in developing, do I work with them on sight words? Do I work with them on sounding that out? How do I best prepare them? Okay, so the sight words are the words that if you sound it out, and this might sound like very basic, but I'm going to explain it to you like I would to the kids yeah. or also to parents during conferences when I get this kind of a question. If I sound out the... So it's, they have to learn the, they just need to know that T-H-E is the. Okay. You can't sound it out. And I like to tell the kids, some words break all the rules. We just work so hard to learn all the letter sounds. And guess what? There are some words, they're so tricky. <laughs> you can't do that. Can you believe it? They break the rules. So we talk about how these are sight words, you just have to know them. Okay. And we learn these words by practicing these words in our books. And um, about 10 years ago, we wanted kids to learn about 20 words. Oh, 20 words in kindergarten. I can't believe we were asking kids to do that. Now they're learning over 120, 160. I mean, it's the exposure, reading words in text. Did a lot of years of flashcards. We had some great word callers. They could read the word the and are and our, but not in a book. <laughs> they learned it really well on a flashcard. So reading books, finding the words in text. And so, does that kind of answer the question? So look at look at the word. If it's cat, you can sound it out. If it's a high frequency okay. word that um, you can tell that if you sound this out, it's not going to sound like the. Okay. <laughs> kind of use that as a general guideline. Okay, great. But it's fun to be able to tell the kids that words break rules. No, it's so convenient. <laughs> and that's one of our power goals is to learn the one green words. We call them our power goal and we put our arms up. We're going to be strong readers by learning these words and they're very proud when they can pick up on these tricky words. Okay. Is that helpful? Yeah. Where can you learn more about the district-wide schools um, in case one would be a good fit for your child? Great question. How do I learn more about the district-wide options? Oh, I'm not connected to the internet. Um, 
while she's trying to connect, yeah. I saved some questions from previous years when I've visited Aldrich before, and uh, just in case there were, sometimes you, you don't know what you don't know and you aren't sure what to ask, and one of the questions that's often asked is what is a typical class size, typically between 17 and 23 kids. I believe most schools now that were full day have access to some para support, maybe not the full day, but maybe um, you know an hour or two to support some of that small group instruction I described where I'm trying to meet the needs of all of the students. I'm fortunate at Riverside I have a full-time para from eight, uh, 9.35 until 3.30, so we always have two adults in the classroom, which is fabulous. Um, often a question about homework. The I believe it's district-wide that it's about 30 minutes of reading to with your child every night. We call that, with Action 100, we call that two steps of reading. 15 minutes is considered a step, and that's where the kiddos um, keep track of their, their reading log. When you keep track of your learning, you're sometimes motivated to hit your next goal, and their goal is to hit 100 steps of reading, so every 15 minutes is a step of reading. They're very proud to do that work. So reading is the main homework. There are some math worksheets activities that will come home frequently um, throughout the, the school year also, different at each school. Same homework, but might be once a week, it might be once a month, depending on each school. So those are some past questions that we've had. So this is our uh, rochester.k12.mn.us. Go to departments, Office of the Assistant Superintendent district-wide online application. <coughs> Click on that and then um, there's obviously the application here. Uh, this gives you a wealth of information here and then here we talk about all the different offerings. So you can look at Gage, Gage Spanish Immersion, Fridell, etc. We also have FAQs um, here as well. So after you read through that, if you still have questions, just call um, my office and we'll be able to field your questions on that. If you go to the specific school you're interested in, too, it'll list like days where they have uh, tours and stuff where yeah, parents can go you. and see if they have something interested in. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. The there should be tours at every school that are, that are going on right now. I know we have one coming up at our school very soon. Can you help define what makes it a district-wide school? Mm -hmm. Why does it give the district-wide sense of care to Riverside? So what is a district-wide school? Why are some district-wide, why are some neighborhood? So um, our district-wide options, again, are Gage Spanish Immersion. So we do have Gage regular neighborhood school. And then within that, we have a Spanish Immersion program, which is district-wide. Then we have a Franklin Elementary Neighborhood School. Inside Franklin is Franklin Montessori Program. Then we have Washington, which uses the core knowledge curriculum. We have Longfellow, which is our 4515 school. What that means is our students start there in, in mid to end of July, and they have 45 days of instruction, and then a three-week uh, break. And then there's some families can sign up for what we call intercession, where uh, they have activities and things during those um, 15 days. But essentially, Longfellow starts earlier in the summer, but has longer breaks than our regular school year does, if that makes sense. Then um, Lincoln is our K-8. So that means we have kindergarten through eighth grade. That's our only K-8 in the district. Um, did I miss anybody? Fridell is our middle school that's six through eight. So what does that mean to be district-wide? So as long as you're living in our school district, you're assigned to a school based on your address. So we, based on our address, go to Gibbs. Um, but if you want to apply, you can choose to apply for one of these schools. And then what that means is if your child is selected to attend, they can go to that school. And 
there's much, much more information about each individual program, but our district-wide options just have something a little bit different about each of them. So like Longfellows are only 4515, for example. We do offer um, transportation. Um, so if you live in the Gibbs attendance area that you want to go to Longfellow, then you would be eligible to have transportation down there as well. I'm giving you about a this much of a surface answer, but there's a ton of information on there as well. So, and families, you know, some families really are interested in our district-wide options, and some families really like the neighborhood um, option as well. We love our neighborhood school. It just depends on, on what you're looking for. We also have a, say that again? Right. So what will the kindergartners experience be? The difference really at Longfellow is going to be an earlier start, right? Earlier start to the school year. Um, the difference at Spanish Immersion is, I think, pretty obvious. Um, there's some slight differences in um, curriculum that's used at Washington um, and Lincoln. There's really just the age level, K through 8. So the experiences will be pretty similar to what you would see in your neighborhood school. There is um, some thought among some families that class sizes are smaller in our district-wide options, and that's not true. Okay. Time for maybe one or two more questions? How long does the Spanish immersion go for? Um, so right now, we have a kindergarten, and then we have a first grade, and we started with kindergarten. So the next year, Spanish immersion will be K-1-2. The year after, it'll be K-1-2-3. And so it's going to feed all the way up through fifth grade. Um, it'll just take us a little while to get there, but if you start your kindergartner next year, they will have that K-5 through experience in Spanish immersion. We don't have a Spanish Immersion Middle School or Spanish Immersion High School, but we do offer Spanish at middle school and we do offer Spanish at high school. Mm -hmm. Great question. This is maybe silly, but does the after school care? It just takes place in the same school that they've attended all day. They don't get bused anywhere or changed mm -hmm. anywhere. Great question. So where does our school age uh, child care occur when it's after school? So we have after school and before school that you can sign your child up for in the school that they're attending. And then we also have summer care, um, but that is most likely not at the site that your child attends. We just have it regionally. Um, so I think this summer, I think it's maybe at Sunset Terrace. I'm not positive on that. And then um, we do have during the school year care when it's not um, school days. And I think that again is regionally. But for your after school and before school during a regular school day, it would be in your neighborhood, right? In the school that you're attending. If I could add, hearing you say like they're not bus somewhere, thinking about the logistics of getting them to the classroom, just to share with you that we collaborate with the SAC teachers, especially at the start of the school year, to hand-to-hand -hand deliver the kids to the kindergarten classroom. And once they're independent and they can do it on their own, then they can travel to and from SAC to their kindergarten classroom the start and end of the day. But we make sure that they are well trained before we release them so that you know that when, when you drop them off at SAC, they will hand them over right to me, or right to the teacher. All right, well, we have certainly appreciated spending this um, evening with you tonight. If you have any questions, you can start with my office, 328-4300, and we'll route you to where um, you need to go. Thank you so much.